All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, as people come in, we'll move forward. So, hello, my name is uh, Frederick Mitchell. Um, this session is Math, Science, and Star Trek, Explaining the Value of Team Diversity. Uh, quick little fun fact about this session. I've actually been doing this session for close to 12 years now. <laughs> A long time ago, this session was born out of some frustration that I had with the Drupal community all those years ago, and really just their understanding of why it's important to be an inclusive community. And basically, my hack to try to convince the community that this was a good idea was to put Star Trek in the name of a session, because I knew that would at least bring people out, and then kind of hit them with some other sort of stuff. So. Since then, it's been 12 years, obviously life has changed, the you know, demographics of, of our community has changed a bit, the uh, culture of our community has changed um, a, a lot, which I'm happy to say, and um, you know, so what you're going to see in this presentation is sort of a, an evolution of these ideas. Um, so yeah, hopefully you'll enjoy it. Oh, the other thing I'll, I'll mention, um, I don't really know like the purpose of AI right now, so what I basically did was I want to try it. You're going to see a bunch of AI generated images that are probably going to look weird, but you know, we'll just have fun with it. So. The fingers crossed. That's right. <laughs> Here's the obligatory sponsor slide that I was told to add to my presentation, so there you go. So I'll give it up for the sponsors. Okay, so basically the, the idea behind this talk is really... Um, how does a culture value diversity and what do you actually get if you do that? And the answer really is this concept in business terms called psychological safety. And psychological safety in the workplace is basically this idea that you have a culture and you have a team that feels very, they feel comfortable to challenge, to ask questions, to make mistakes, to do different things for um, a bigger purpose and they're not going to be crucified if they say something wrong or if they offend something, right? It's sort of like the, the, the ultimate goal. And the allegory here is that despite all the Star Treks, I chose to use the allegory of Star Trek Voyager mainly because I thought the story was very unique and then two, if, you're not, if you don't know the, the background behind Voyager is that the way that this cast actually came together within the Star Trek universe is that there are people on here that were actually against each other. They were warring at the beginning of the episodes. There were different factions that were warring. They happened to be trapped on the same ship fighting each other, and then that ship was sent so far away from Earth that they had to work together to actually make it back home. So that was the premise of why I chose Voyager. I know a lot of Trekkies in the room are like, why do you pick Voyager? Voyager is not the, that's the reason why. <laughs> it's because of the allegory of the fact that you have to work with people who are diametrically opposed to some of the values that you may even have, things that you believe, and what kind of culture and things do you have to have to ultimately sort of bring them together. The other thing that's really cool about the allegory of Voyager, obviously just looking at this crew, is that Demographically, it's a very diverse crew, right? It's the first time they, there was a female-led captain in the, in the universe. There were a lot of different sort of unique things that would sort of go through that. So the first thing, when we talk about the word diversity, and it, you know, depending upon, I guess, where you are in the country, it could be, I don't know, a bad word, a sensitive word, or whatever, right? I think it's important to sort of define it. And I think the most important thing to sort of take away is there's really kind of three kinds. The first is cognitive diversity. And this is an AI-generated image of when I typed in some prompts, show me the example of a psychologically safe workplace <laughs> with a lot of cognitive diversity. So what you're seeing here is a bunch of people who feel like they can have a conversation. You've got some remote workers with some really weird faces. You've got you know, some cool stuff here. But this is what AI believes psychologically safe workplace looks like, just so you're all on the same page. But in terms of cognitive diversity, cognitive diversity, what that basically means is how you think. What's your area of expertise? A lot of government sort of, um, let's just say, spy agencies use this very well because they use that as a way to crack different types of codes and different secrets because they have found that people from different cognitive bases think about problems completely differently. A good example is like, um, there, are, there are cases during various wars where um, folks who were experts in um, flowers or, or botany or folks who had different social science skills were actually recruited into 
various intelligence agencies because of the way they thought, and they were able to see problems and not have any background in crypto cryptography, but they were able to actually solve those problems because of the patterns that they saw based on how it was presented. So cognitive diversity is this idea of how you think it's usually driven by your area of expertise, and it's usually based on your workflow, how you solve the problem, right? You sort of see this in our various roles, right? Once someone's there, people have different roles. You have UX, you have designers, you have developers, you have whatever. The biggest, I will say, weakness or caution area when you're thinking about cognitive diversity is it's almost impossible to recruit for, right? You can't look at a person and be like, oh, they're a cognitively diverse person. Sure, if someone chooses to share, maybe they have a neurodivergence or something like that, maybe that's a thing. But even if that's the case, right, do you, how, how do you incorporate that? How do you value that? What is that in relative to maybe building a team or valuing a team member? But it is a type of diversity. And the allegory here is um, in Star Trek, this character, her name was Seven of Nine. And basically her background was she was a human scientist who was captured by the Borg. The Borg who were, who were not familiar with that it was basically this race of machines that assimilated all organic life to create a perfect, essentially, life form. So they would strip out all the things that they felt unnecessary to create a cyborg or a Borg race that was from a single hive mind that could efficiently and do certain things, including take over the world, right? So what's interesting about this character in Star Trek is that she sort of encaps encapsulates this idea of thinking one way and it only has to be, if it's not logical, it doesn't really have any value. And what's interesting about that from a team perspective is there, you know, that's sort of like the developer on the team, right? They need to understand exactly logical how that sort of works because the way that they think, the way that they solve, solve problems is probably cognitively different than maybe some of the other team members. And if we're not part of a psychologically safe space where that type of cognitive diversity is respected, then they may or may not want to volunteer their opinions or maybe on the opposite, they may feel they need to be more demonstrative and more resolute about their opinion because they see things so clearly. And we see this in the real world as we see, this is an interesting sort of example. On the left is a picture of, can anyone tell me what those are? Anyone got a guess what that is? Those are carabiners, right? So those are the things that you hook things, when you're doing climbing, you hook that into and then you, you, know, you hook your, your, your slack line, your safety lines to it. All three of those are actually carabiners. The first one is actually a human design carabiner. The second one was put into an AI system to come up with certain parameters, right? You can see the design and the understanding of what it is has changed. And then the third one is even given more parameters, say, with the least amount of metal, but it's actually even more stronger. The point is, is that when you start to introduce various types of cognitive diversity to a particular problem, it's going to look completely different from those who may think completely differently, right? Just from a visual perspective, you can have examples like this. On the right is actually a mathematical equation, because I said I'd show you some math. I won't get into it too much. But on the right is actually a mathematical equation from a proof from a paper that posits the theory that diversity trumps ability. And basically, what they're basically saying is that given a certain set of conditions, a very hard problem, a large sample size set, et cetera, that a group of people with a diverse set of skills and ways of thinking about it will outperform a same set, a group of people who have a same way of thinking when trying to solve that hard problem. Again, just sort of reinforcing this idea of cognitive diversity and some of its values when it comes to a particular team. <laughs> Follow me so far? All right, cool. So let's get to the next definition. Another type of diversity is called experiential diversity. And then you can probably tell from the name, this is how familiar you are with the problem you're trying to solve. So has your experience, has the things you've lived through informed how you see things and what kind of solutions you look for, right? One of the concepts, if you've ever worked with a junior developer, is something that is called Shoshin, which is beginner's mind. This idea that when beginners see a problem, they don't, know, have, they don't have any experience for that problem, so their questions are 
based on their own sort of lived experience and how, how they see the world at that point. But as you get more experience with a particular problem, right, the way you ask your questions is going to be based on the assumptions of your experience dealing with that problem. And a lot of times, and I'm sure you all sort of experienced this, sometimes the problems that we need to solve as a team, a lot of what happens when things break down is because people have different assumptions. Right? Someone assumes that you already know this particular piece of knowledge, or you know this person, or what have you, and that experiential diversity, or that lack of shoshin, that lack of beginner's mind sort of creeps up. And depending upon personality types and the culture of the team and the organization, you can sort of butt heads there. The other thing that sort of comes into the experiential diversity concept is when you're trying to bring on new team members. And this concept of, well, I want the most qualified. Right? And a lot of times, and I, I've heard this many times within Drupal community, right? There's a lot of senior talent, but how do you actually become senior talent? And I want this, and what, how do you differentiate? How do you figure out the most qualified given where we are as a team and what the goals are, et cetera? Right? Qualification, again, is based on the person or team and their particular perspective of what they believe is the most qualified thing. Some people may value technical. Some people may value relationship-based things. Some people may value leadership skills. Some people may value curiosity and questions, resiliency, things of that nature. So that experiential diversity, how you, what has happened in your life greatly informs how you see certain things. The biggest weakness of just sort of for, focusing on experiential diversity is everything looks like a nail. When you've <laughs> solved some problems, right, then you want to solve it the way you already know how it needs to be solved. And the allegory here from the Star Trek perspective is this officer right here. So this is Belana Torres. She is the chief engineer on Star Trek Voyager. And what is unique about her character in uh, the show is a couple of things. One, she was the leader of the rebels who was fighting Star Trek before they even got before they were cast in a, in a really bad situation, which means she was enemy number one, right? But somehow, in order for them to get back, her experience based, the, the captain at the time, and the crew at that time, realized her experience being in that position made her chief, um, the main person who should be the chief engineer, the main engineer on the ship, in order to come up with creative solutions to get them back home. At the same time, because of her background, and for those who know anything about Star Trek, she is half Klingon as well. That may mean something to you or not. But because of her background too, being a rebel, she also had a very fiery personality and was very, very combative. So when it came working together with different people, that was a whole thing. So even though she had the experience and she had different types of experience, right, there was some friction there in terms of blending inside of the team when it comes to actually solving the problem. And what you typically see this in is when, again, if you ever have a team and you're bringing in new people to the team, what the prompt for this AI image was, <laughs> show me a psychologically safe place set in Wakanda of a junior developer trying to solve a problem but doesn't want to ask the question. <laughs> so the AI came up with this answer, right? But basically, the point I'm trying to make here is if you don't have a psychologically safe place, and there's too much emphasis on experiential diversity. When you, br or when you bring in a new person, whether they're junior or not, the culture can shift in the direction of, well, I need to have already known how to do this before I even ask a question. And in those cases, as you may have experienced, right, that's when you have cost overruns. That's when you figure out, oh, what happened here? Oh, I thought it was this, and why didn't you ask? Well, because I thought I would look this way, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that sort of thing you have to kind of think about when sort of building out your, these various teams, right? And last but not least is everyone's favorite, demographic diversity, right? This is the one that is the politically hot football and all the words that I'm not going to repeat here of how we talk about this. And this is the hardest thing. And this is the thing that, right, is the most um, difficult to discuss in a workplace given our history in this country for those who are from this country. But basically, demographic diversity is what you look like and what you're perceiving, your gender, your race, your ethnicity, your class, things that affect um, how you exist in the world and how the culture that we all live in 
perceives you in the world based on your demography. What's interesting about demographic diversity is it informs how you see the existence of various problems based on, because we're all sort of reflecting the culture that we live in, right? So for example, if you've talked to colleagues, if you're a man, if you've talked to other colleagues who identify as women and you've asked them what it's like to persist in a technical environment for a long period of time, you will get feedback about certain situations that they may have encountered where they may not have felt welcome, they may not have felt listened to, they may not have felt valued, and part of the reason why that happens is because in our culture we have, right, we have a male-dominated culture that doesn't value certain things for people who identify as women. And that essentially informs us whether subconsciously or consciously of how we treat other people and that demographic diversity ultimately affects that person and how they see the world based on what they've experienced. That's the point I'm trying to make here is that the value of demographic diversity is the people are essentially absorbing their experience from the culture and it creates a unique way of how they see problems and how they see solutions. It's the easiest to identify, right? But it's the hardest to collaborate with because we have laws against preferencing certain demographics over others. The allegory here in terms of Star Trek Voyager, for those who don't know who this is, this is Tuvok. Tuvok is a Vulcan, and in the Star Trek world, the Vulcans are a highly logical race. They have honed their race. Again, when I say race, I'm talking about beings on another planet, right? Race of beings. They have honed, their culture literally suppresses all emotion and requires all members of their society to look at things in a very logical way. On a personal preference, Right? When I first watched this show, Tuvok was also one of the first black characters that actually represented a character that was based on logic and calmness. Up until this point within sort of scientific cinema or scientific TV, right, a lot of the black characters were either sort of associated or they represented characters that sometimes pulled in tropes about black people in the shows emotional, intelligence, etc. So he was one of the first within this sector, and obviously there's been many since then. This is back in the 90s. He was one of the first to represent a concept and one of the first, because I think at that point in time, Spock was sort of the stereotypical Vulcan. And so when he was introduced as part of the Vulcan race, there was a lot of conversation about, you know, what have you. But I think what's interesting to sort of take away from Tuvok is this idea that just because I may not show emotion doesn't mean it's easy to suppress it, right? This idea that even though he has been trained and brought up in a culture that values a particular way of thinking, it takes a tremendous amount of energy to stay consistently and concentrate from that point of view all the way through all the various challenges that you have. And that's a unique thing about having um, a diverse team, especially when it comes from a demographic perspective, because those cultural influences and the way you see the world are going to influence how people see things. And even though they may seem like it's, okay, well, this is what I know about whatever, doesn't mean it's easy to essentially integrate those thoughts into the broader team, if that makes sense. Here's a good example, right? And of course, it's a cartoon, so take it for a grain of salt. But the idea Right, that any time you're thinking about building a team, leading a team, figuring out how you want to build your company, figuring out how you want to include this project, there are certain things where one side it should seem very obvious <laughs> where the value comes, and others it's not as obvious. And some of those things can come from demographic diversity. So now that I've sort of laid the foundation of different types of diversity and what that means, and we're also on the same page of the goal we're going towards, this psychologically safe workplace. Now I want to kind of get into the how. How do you actually get to that point? And what are some of the key mechanisms that teams and leaders need to focus on to actually make sure that they're creating a type of workplace if that's your goal? And one of the first concepts I want to bring up is IQ versus EQ. 
So everyone knows IQ is basically an intelligence quotient. It's a number. It's something that everyone's sort of heard of. I think what may not be as uh, known is that IQ is usually set around when you're very young and it doesn't change. And it's a measure of how well you can solve problems. So it's, it's almost like an acceleration measure for a person's brain, right? So it's not how smart you are, it's more of how quickly can you identify a pattern and then try to solve that problem, right? It's just it's a physical sort of thing. It's a pre-processed number. Based on your genes or your genetic makeup, you can pre-process things at this rate before the problem is actually presented to you. The other side of that is something called EQ. And maybe you've heard of this emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence is completely different. It doesn't have a number, and it's more of a post-process evaluation. Emotional intelligence is how well you can measure emotions in others. And it's something that you can change over time. And it's something that has been proven through various studies over and over and over again that emotionally intelligent groups, i.e. members of groups who can read the emotions of various team members, outperform those who may even have a set of members who have an average higher intelligence, IQ, I should say. Now, high EQ individuals is a worst and best case situation, right? So in the worst case, a high EQ person may be like a really crappy salesperson. Right? Because they know how to read your emotions, they know when you're uncomfortable, they know when you really don't, they're just trying to get out of there, but they're going to keep selling you, etc. Right? That's sort of like the worst, at the worst end. Not all salespeople, I'm just saying they're really crazy. Right? But on the best case, right, on that same spectrum, someone with a high EQ could be a tribal leader. A really good leader who understands at the end of the day, right, we are in this together, we're going to figure this out, and we are going to change the world. And they go and have individual relationships with their team members and figure out how to get the best out of them. EQ, again, is a post-process sort of evaluation sort of metric. I think the other thing that is important to understand about EQ is that this is the thing that's most aligned to what makes people like working where they work was just having a conversation with colleagues, literally not right before this, um, before this talk, and we were talking about how, it's, how nice it is to actually work with people that we like, work with people that respect, work with people who actually work well together, and have sort of the technical knowledge to be able to bounce ideas off and figure things out, right? When you say, how is your day, or how's work going, right? You typically don't just think about the technical challenges and whatever it is problem you're trying to solve. You think about the people you're working with, whether, they, whether you feel respected, whether you feel heard, and whether you feel like you can contribute. Those are all parts of a culture that has a high EQ. And this AI image is their attempt to explain the difference between IQ and EQ. So that's what that is. That <laughs> this is all AI generated. All these ones are AI ones. Black or not. Like the exactly. The other kinds of what I want to kind of throw out there, and I sort of talked on a little bit, is this idea of perspective and heuristic, right? So perspective is how you look at a problem, right? Your exploratory processes of how you actually look at a problem. Your heuristic is how you search for a solution, the structures you use to search for a solution. And what's interesting, when you start bringing in these concepts of EQ and groups who have high emotional intelligence outperform others who don't, the other thing that's interesting about perspective and heuristic is there's a lot of studies that also connect the idea that those diverse groups, as we define diversity in all the different ways, right, that folks who work within a diverse group tend to have an advantage because all the various members don't make assumptions about the other person and what they commonly believe the other person knows. So facts are checked a little bit differently, right? You tend to process things a little bit carefully. This is sort of just a, this is an automatic thing that human beings do. When you're around a person that, again, at the most basic sense is demographically different than you, but even at a layered sense, if you get to know them, right, it's different than how they process information, you may ask a bit more questions. You may have a more collaborative discussion to make sure that you're both on the same page before you move forward, which is different than those situations where if you're in a group where maybe someone came from the same school as you, or you all have the same background, or you whatever it is, right? You just assume that everyone knows the same kind of common knowledge and you sort of move forward. And when it comes to solving hard problems, right? 
when it comes to coming up with different heuristics, the structure of how you solve a problem, even different perspectives, how you see the problem as this comic sort of shows, right? The people in the out group, and in this case, out group is not part of the majority, tend to outperform those of a group that is majority from a particular culture, mainly because of that cognitive bias, that checking, and all those different things, right? And this is the AI image when I asked to explain the difference between perspective and heuristic. What it's basically showing is, again, your perspective is how you explore and figure out various problems. Where do you go to? And your heuristic is how you solve them. What are the structures you use to try to solve them, right? If one person Googles all the time, or the other person reaches out to their network, or the other person maybe asks some questions, those can all be sort of impacted based on your cognitive, your experiential, and your democratic diversity. Make sense? All right, cool. But this approach is not without risks, right? So when you're trying to go towards a psychologically safe environment, trying to build that up. One of the biggest risks when you're trying to sort of build this culture and you're bringing all these various people who think differently is speed. It takes a while for people to get to know each other and feel comfortable and test the various cultures you're trying to build as a leader on a project, on a team, or in a company, right? This is the AI's generation when I said, can you please do the comparison contrast of the tortoise and the hare. And for whatever reason, they put the hare's face on the tortoise, but whatever, <laughs> right? But the point is, is that if you're the leader of whatever it is you're doing, a project, a team, a culture, understanding that speed is not the most important priority, even though we live in a market-driven society and that typically tends to where the pressure is, right? If you understand that at the beginning, that actually, at the end of the day, I want a long-term solution. I'm trying to build a culture that values people, where they come from, and I want people to feel safe to question things and challenge things. That takes time, and that takes practice, and mistakes will happen, which means that those in leadership need to understand those particular risks, right? The other one that's sort of the risk with this approach, when you're trying to build this type of team and this culture, it's confusion. People are gonna see things differently. Words are gonna mean different things to different people. You may have to create a culture of apology, of making sure people aren't taking things personally and understanding that that goal is all the same. We are just trying to understand each other. We're trying to figure out how to solve this problem. So if I said something or said something a certain way, maybe I was having a bad day, maybe I'm still working on my EQ and learning how to actually talk to people, right? Does your culture and do your leaders re-emphasize, hey, we need to make sure that maybe we're training certain people a certain way. Maybe we need to have certain things that we engage with to make sure everyone understands how that sort of happens. And this AI image is basically, I put in there, had the tortoise explain to the rabbit the importance of going slow before going fast, and that's what it sort of came up with. I'm not sure what that is, right? But the other thing that sort of comes from this, and this is really important to understand, especially as leaders in your organization, the crux of getting a healthy culture, especially from, a, from people who come from a variety of diverse um, perspectives, is you have to basically allow for vulnerability. And vulnerability is a really hard thing to do in the office place, right? And again, I think it's important to understand that if you don't do that, you'll fall into a trap which is usually called Hanlon's razor, which is the idea that most failures and most things that can be attributed to confusion or incompetence can sometimes be attributed to malice. So this idea that, okay, I made a mistake, but because the culture is focused on output, it's focused on efficiency, it's focused on credit, right? That person who maybe is dependent upon the work that you're doing will feel a personal slight because, well, they just did that to mess me up. And now all of a sudden you have this sort of toxic piece inside of your culture, even though you may have a cognitive, experiential, or demogra and or demographic diverse team. It may look like, hey, look at all this diversity we have in our, in our company and in our team, and et cetera. But if you don't cultivate a sense of putting value on vulnerability, then certain, those, those confusion, the way people talk, the misunderstandings can create 
poison pills that just reinforces people's bias. And then last but not least to be looking out for is something called um, the common knowledge effect. Again, this idea that because we all sort of come from the, that you just assume you, we're starting from the same spot. So last but not least, as I wrap up here, the last thing I want to kind of throw out there is, okay, so what are some things, if I do want this and I am a leader in my organization, what are some things that I could be doing, I could be recommending to make sure if this is, if this is where I want to go, if this is where I want my organization to go, if this is where I want my team to go, what are some things that I should be doing to facilitate this? In the allegory here, for those who don't know, this is Captain Janeway. Again, she was one of the first, some people may know her as the Orange is New Black person when that show came on. It's Kate Mulgrew. I don't know what she's doing now. I'm, I'm hoping. That What's that? There's coffee in that nebula. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. We got some Trek fans here. Right? So she was one of the first um, captains, um, what, what female captains in the universe that was introduced again in the 90s. And what was really interesting about her character was just how dogged and determined she was. Right? The mission that, she, that was put in front of her was getting everyone back safely. It was a very, very difficult mission, again, based on all the things that we sort of talked about. And one of the things that she exemplified and what I'll sort of talk about is this concept of, I said it earlier, tribal leadership. Tribal leadership is basically this idea that in all of us, depending upon our various capacities, whether we're project managers, tech leads, team leads, agency leads, community leads, whatever that is, right, even this Drupal community, that there's always a way to be a leader, but it's usually kind of in five different levels. So the first level is usually what doesn't make a good leader, but some people like this, and that is, I'm not really good enough, I don't think I can do it. The imposter syndrome sort of level, right? I can't really do anything, and we all have met people like that, and we try to encourage them, no, no, you're good, right? The second level of leadership after that is, well, we're not that great. Yes, no matter how hard we try, no matter what we do, we just can't get it done and we're always going to be behind and we're always going to have these issues co copying up because of this person, that person, and because of me and I don't understand. Then you've got sort of the third level and this is the one that's the most common within our culture and that is I'm great but everyone else is shit, <laughs> right? This idea that I'm the person who knows what needs to happen but if I could just deal with all these other people who don't know what the hell they're doing, then everything will be fine, right? Then you got the fourth level, which is where you started, if you think about your work experiences that you've really valued, you've got leaders who reemphasize, we are awesome, it's us versus them, right? I remember back in the day when I went to uh, DrupalCon probably, I don't know, I think it was in Denver a long time ago, I used to be part of this agency called Treehouse Agency, and if you've ever been to a DrupalCon, a lot of times agencies will print custom shirts like this and then everyone will be walking around with their shirt and then everyone's like, okay, wait, you? and you go to see what shirt they are, et cetera. Well, that DrupalCon, we actually printed custom vests. <laughs> and we had this, these custom, they were called Scotty vests. And it had, our, it had our patch on it, it had all these pockets and it was really interesting. And I remember thinking like, wow, we're really gonna do this, okay. It was so different than everyone else, right? But when I got there, it was like, oh man, this is so cool. I'm part of the agency that has these vests and we're standing out, right? This us versus them mentality is another sort of that fourth level of leadership. And that's the ones that, you know, especially depending upon whether you're part of an agency or some other organization, those are the ones where you sort of feel very, very dynamic. Things are great. Then you have sort of the rare air, which is the fifth level, which is we are going to change the world. Right? You have leaders, these inspiring leaders who just believe in the potential of everyone. There is no bad apple. We just have to keep working at it and we're going to solve sort of hard problems. And obviously, if you've ever been part of that, that type of organization, probably never leave because that's a very rare thing. But I'm giving you the examples in terms of those are the levels of the type of leadership to try to facilitate these type of things. And she represents that. Right At the end of the day, she had to go from, I'm not sure if I can be a captain, to, oh crap, I don't think we're good enough to actually fix these problems, to, you know what, the folks who are part of Starfleet, they're the ones who, I, I can do this, but they can't do it, and the people who have Starfleet training are the ones who are the best, to, you know what, at the end of the day, this is who we, we have, and we have to figure this out, to ultimately, of course, if you keep watching various Star Trek episodes, to, 
it's one of like the most celebrated crews ever, and this is what they changed, and they come up with all these innovations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Another thing that sort of helps leaders and something that I recommend is something called mental models. And this is the AI representation of when I type in, show me various mental models that leaders can have in order to facilitate tribal leadership, right? So I'll give you a few. I sort of highlighted there, but I want to kind of give it to you just, just so you understand. And, and if you want to learn more about this, um, there's, a, there's a website called the Farnham Street Blog, F-A-R-N-A-M. It's, a, it's, it's free to use, it's free to access. They have a whole page of like all these mental models. Um, Charlie Munger swears by them. It's a whole sort of thing if you want to kind of get more details. But I want to kind of highlight three. And the reason I want to highlight these is because these are the sort of things you can trigger off of that when your team is having discussions and when you're trying to figure out how to get the various people from different perspectives, whether it's cognitive or demographic or experiential, making sure they understand each other, see each other, that you can be vulnerable in that space. Again, if that's the goal you want to have for your, your organization, one of them is called inversion. The inversion mental model basically says, okay, if there's a problem, do the members or does the person invert the question, right? So for example, if something isn't working, let's say, hey, we're trying to deploy this feature and the build isn't working, right? And all these various people have various thoughts of why it isn't working. Well, your code broke this and this broke that and maybe it's that and maybe it's that. Do they invert the problem? Well, when did it work? What were the factors that caused it to work at that particular time? What was changed up until that point? Inverting a problem, inverting how you approach a particular question when someone is sort of confused or maybe you have tension, that is a sign of, again, creating that psychologically safe workplace and where people can be vulnerable. Because sometimes when you invert the problem, you think about maybe the, the opposite of how it's being presented allows the team to sort of mull over, oh, okay, I never thought about it like that. It's sort of a, it goes from prove me wrong to what am I missing type of mentality, inverting the problem. The second one is called the map is not the territory. And basically what this mental model basically shows, if anyone's ever looked at a map, you know that just because you have the map does not mean that's exactly what the terrain looks like. Right? You can have all the, I mean, you can have Google Maps, you, I'm sure everyone's used Google Maps or any kind of maps you have, and you get there like, wait, this isn't on the map, like what, what is actually happening? This is, they don't really, and the point of that mental model is always include nuance. That there is no absolutes. Nuance is a given. That any opinion, any thought process, any solution will always have nuance. That the map, even if I can paint you a perfect picture, of exactly what's going to happen and what this person said and what is this and this is going to be like this way and we're going to do it this way. Nuance is a given. And so you have to be able to have an open mind and say, oh, okay, I didn't realize that that was the part that was missing that I didn't see as this thing was being explained. And the third one that I'll throw out there that I think is a really highlight of leaders who are trying to create these spaces is what's called the circle of competence. And basically what that means is that when you have leaders who understand that people understand words differently, they have different experiences, their, the culture and what they grew up in maybe influence how they see things, they have different perspectives, different hu heuristics, their goal is to focus on being successful instead of being right. That everyone has their own circle of competence and at the end of the day, I or we need to make sure we have a kind of space that respects that fact. And at the end of the day, is this conversation, are these processes, are we being successful or are we just reinforcing a person or a particular set of people that they need to be correct and just reinforcing that part at the expense of, again, a psychologically safe place where people can challenge things, etc. For those who are into books, these are the two books that I have bought and given away the most. I've probably given away at least 30 versions, 30 copies of each one of these books. The first book on the left is a book that is really gets into the nitty gritty of just speaking and talking. It literally gives you words and phrases of when you have conflicts and things are getting heated, what are the words that can sort of tap into those deep psychological things that happen to us when we get upset to kind of bring things down. I'll be quite honest, 
this book, Crucial Conversations, along with therapy, has basically saved my marriage and my relationship with my kids. I'm just being honest, right? Like, it is one of those type of things where it gives all these examples of, well, when this happens, if you say it like this, and this is what is happening, this, so if you say this, see what happens, and this is what will probably happen. And I tried it, and I'm like, wow, the demeanor changed, the tenor changed. Okay, I need to, so again, practice, practice. The EQ, this is the EQ book, right? Number one EQ book that I recommend for those who want to kind of go down this road. And then this other one, again, I sort of talked about it, stole the, stole the title. But that go, this one kind of goes deeper into that five levels that I mentioned earlier to facilitate this within your organization. Try to make some of these things autonomous. Because we all know if we're a leader of something, our goal is for the people we work with to basically do this on their own without having to be told to do it. And then it just sort of happens automatically, right? So at the end of the day, I just want to say that the value of diversity is in its natural construction. Because we are naturally diverse, right? If you value that and you have a place that brings that in, the true value of team diversity is that it can helpfully create a psychologically safe work environment, right? But that can only happen when you have a lot of work pushed into emotional intelligence and collaborative values and you decide as an organization, as a leader, that speed and efficiency are maybe not the most important priorities, which I know is hard to do, just putting it out there, right? At the end of the day, as a leader, being able to establish a time of culture is key. So this is my last image, my last slide. For those who don't know, this is um, actually a Vulcan saying, IDIC. It stands for infinite diversities and infinite combinations. This is actually like part of their ethos within the Vulcan uh, race. So yeah, thank you for listening. I appreciate you coming. So we have nine minutes. Are there any questions? I just did that good a job. Okay, go ahead. So one of the biggest barriers I've found to Producing on the University is this idea that anyone entering an organization must assimilate to the organization, to the culture. As if the workplace culture was this rigid thing, um, when in reality it's, it's actually pretty fluid based on the personnel that you have there. So, how can we kind of shape the. It's, it's logical because. Bringing somebody into an organization, you don't want the team to have to slow down to learn cognitively, experientially, you know, get a rep through this new person. You want them to come into the organization and basically just meet the needs. So I get it from that perspective, but that's that doesn't create the safe space that you're talking about. It doesn't allow for the things that would make us more efficient and effective as a whole. So how can we shape the existing uh, personnel and staff there to understand these events, people exiting and leaving, are major events to our organization that's going to cause us to shift, to slow down, et cetera. But if we do it effectively, we will be better as an organization to fight this assimilation. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And just for the microphone, the question was, given the fact that certain organizations have processes and they have things in place, Right, and you're trying to assimilate people, again that word assimilate, for terminology, you're trying to bring people in to how things are, right? How do you actually change it if on the other side people are leaving and maybe the culture isn't as great? And I think it's a great question. I think the, from my experience working at various organizations and trying to build this with my own organization, at the end of the day I think the question is what are the goals of that team? What are the goals of culture? For, so for example, if leadership states that the goal is just to get things done, and if the cost of that is people turning over, and they acknowledge that, then that tells you the answer, right? That tells you what the priority is. Again, it kind of goes back to, do the, does the leadership who ultimately can influence the culture, what do they prioritize? Do they prioritize being right, or do they prioritize being successful? And if they prioritize being successful, what are their measurements of success? So what I have done in the past, and I've literally just asked, I will 
try to set aside one-on-one time or pull people aside or get on their calendar and just ask, okay, maybe I don't understand something because I'm not at your position. You can see things more than me. This is what I'm seeing, and this is what I think is the result of this. I believe that this will lead to this outcome, which doesn't feel like it aligns to the success metrics that you have stated are important for our team. Can you help me understand what I'm missing? And that type of approach, depending upon where you are and what leverage you have and what position you are, it does a couple of things. One, a lot of times people like to feel listened to and heard and they want to be experts. So when you ask the question from a point of maybe I don't understand, it doesn't trigger the sort of psychological defensiveness of why are you asking me this question, right? The second thing it does is that it will hopefully clarify in that space exactly the success, the success metric that you believe should be true and whether that aligns with the person who can be most influential to changing those things. And if those things aren't aligned, then that tells you more about the organization that you're with and the team that you're with, which then you can make a personal choice of like, okay, well, do I just want to deal with this because I literally got it from that person? Or if they end up saying, you know what, I never thought about it like that, what are your thoughts? Then maybe that's how you can sort of change it. But that's, that's what has worked in my experience. A um, couple, five more minutes. Any other questions? Well, thank you for coming. Oh, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. No, you're fine. Um, I was kind of struck by the point you were making when you were talking about the, the uh, super logic of Vulcans, you know, and not to miss how much effort can, can underlie uh, some apparently like very easy looking behaviors or, you know, like, oh, this person is not super logical, that's just how they are. It's important, you were suggesting, to recognize they're working really hard under the surface and you're not seeing it. Um, yeah, that just kind of rang a bell for me with some of my team members who are like real quiet, real direct, real logical developers of the you know. Um, I don't know, do you, do you suggest a way to sort of make them feel like it's a little bit less work for them? Uh, no, it's, it's a great question. And for the microphone, the question was when I was talking about Tuvok and sort of the Vulcan race and, and one of the episodes, there, I don't, I'm not going to remember what the, what the ceremony is, but in one of the episodes, in most episodes, Vulcans go through this process where all of their emotions that they've suppressed have come back up. And there's like this period of time where they just cannot be associated with anyone because they're so, their emotions are they're so enraged, they're so volatile, they have to isolate themselves. Right? And so the quote that I was referencing specifically with Tuvok was he was explaining to another team member that Tuvok, you always look so calm. It seems so logical. He's like, just don't mistake my logic and the, the ease of which I make it look as it being an easy thing. And the question was, I have seen that in some of my team members, developers who are logical, maybe quiet, and I can probably tell that, or how, how, do, you, how do you, I guess, make it easier for them to feel more safe and maybe express some of those emotions or whatever they're feeling if they're so kind of focused on the logical piece. Is that your question? Yeah. yeah. So in my experience, what, what, I, what, I, what I have done and what, what I've seen, honestly, is to praise folks when they make small efforts. Because I think, again, psychologically, when people try to give an opinion or they contribute to a space that you typically don't see them in, maybe you have like a water cooler Slack channel or maybe you have a retreat or maybe you have these other sort of social things or things that can trigger maybe an emotional response or something that requires more collaborative pieces, um, and they present an idea. I have found sort of praising them, whether privately or publicly, depending upon the relationship you have with that person, is, is like, like little things like that just go so far because to that point, you may, they may not share how difficult it is for them to kind of stay on this sort of logical piece, but if they make the effort to share a little bit more, and then that gets recognized and received, and more importantly, acknowledged and said, man, I really appreciate that, et cetera, it makes them more open to other types of feedback, right? So if, if in the future, maybe they express things maybe not as well, right? Because there was a habit of reinforcing positivity, now when you maybe give a constructive piece of feedback, they may not take it as personal because they know, well, they've given me positive before. 
the giving me constructive, they just want this to be a certain place is, is sort of number one. So acknowledging that, I, I think, you know, if people are willing to share, sort of acknowledging that. I think the other thing that I've seen work, and we do this all the time at my organization too, is we just talk about how hard it is, right? I mean, for some it's easy, for some it's more difficult. I think leaders specifically, people, leaders who have hiring and firing capabilities, just to be quite honest, if you have a hiring and firing capability, I think leaders who are vulnerable and actually talk about how difficult it is sometimes to like, you know, I think this is going to be a difficult conversation or, hey, you know, that last conversation we had, I, can, I recognize how difficult that was. You know, I appreciate everyone really trying hard to sort of talk through this. I recognize, you know, I, I let this person, I talk to this person privately. I already knew, I already told them that we we're going to mention this, but we're going to keep working at this. I could have done a better job of trying to facilitate whatever that is. That sort of leadership vulnerability also, again, it's like, you know, People follow examples based on what they see, not what they're told. Because then if you as the leader are exhibiting, again, that positive influence and you're saying, you know what, I made a mistake or, hey, this is really difficult for me sometimes too because I'm such a logical and I work at this and this is what I do all the time, that can sort of pull people out as well. But again, that does require a lot of work. It does require a lot of energy, right? Especially if you're a leader of stuff and you've got all the things you have to do, plus your job, plus all these personalities. You know, it's a lot. And, that, and that's why these things are hard. That's, that's why the efficiency and speed is sort of the default piece. And like I said in, in before, those three levels of tribal leadership, that third one, right? I'm the best, everyone else is crap. That's where a lot of people just sort of stick. They, they sort of stop there because it does require a lot a lot, a lot of energy to get to that fourth tier of we're going to figure this out. I need to figure out your strength. You need to figure out where your caution areas are. I need to understand where you are in the, in the space. Let's keep working at this. Everything's going to be great. We're going to figure this out, et cetera, et cetera. And then it's almost like the metric almost changes to instead of output being number one, it's almost like collaborative spirit is number one. And output is just like an offshoot of the fact that, hey, I see them contributing, I see them encouraging people, I see them helping on the off time, whatever that is, and it just sort of autonomously sort of happens, but, you know, it's, it's difficult. I think we're out of time, but thank you again for coming, I appreciate it.